All right, well, I want to start by welcoming everybody to Revolution Books for the film showing that we're about to do tonight and the discussion that will follow. The film is Dreamland, The Burning of Black Wall Street. And that's really what the film is about. You might hear a little bit from the director before we show it. But let me first tell you Revolution Books. This is a place where this film should be shown, but also a place that you all need to visit frequently. If you have been here with some regularity, continue that regularity and up your involvement in supporting and working with the bookstore. If this is a new thing for you, don't make it your last time here. Because Revolution Books, it's a bookstore with books about the world and books for a new world. The kind of world that humanity is crying out for when you look at the horrors that are being perpetrated around the world and in this country. And at the heart of this bookstore is the work of Bob Avakian, the revolutionary leader and architect of the new communism, which is a new framework for human emancipation. Oh, I guess I should tell you who I am too. <laughs> uh, I'm Carl Dix. I'm a longtime revolutionary activist going back to beginning when I refused to go to Vietnam as a USGI, which kind of dates me. It was in 1970 that I did that. Spent two years in Leavenworth Military Penitentiary for that crime, which is one I would do again and again and again. Because fighting wars for imperialism is something that people should not do. Okay, I'm also a follower of the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakian. Now, just to introduce tonight, Bob Avakian has said that there are three things that need to happen. One is that people need to confront the actual history of this country. Another is people have to dig into how this system works and what it causes. And then the third thing is people have to dig into the solution to all of this. And this film actually helps you to begin to work on that. It gets you, it actually confronts the history. And that's something that is really important today because there's a big fight over it. And I'll probably bring that up in the conversation that I have with the director immediately after the film. And then following that, we're going to invite the audience into the discussion. Uh, I've already told you the title of the film. Let me introduce the director who is here with us tonight, Salima Paroma. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, wow. I'm so uh, just heartened to see all these people from my neighborhood um, here to watch this film. Um, I have always wanted to tell a story about Black Wall Street since I learned about it uh, when I was 20, uh, 15 years ago in college where I learned about it. Um, and years later, uh, as I was making my first films, this is one of the ideas that I had pitched to a lot of people. And they said, no. Oh. And a lot of times it was, for, for me, what I felt, it was too real, it was too raw, the idea that white people had come into a black town and killed black people, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until, actually, G George Floyd was killed, and you know, it was sort of the spirit, and now everybody wanted to tell this story. Um, and uh, I just so happened to, maybe a few months before George Floyd ha uh, happened, I used to come, I used to live right around the corner, I used to come in here all the time. Um, and I might have just mentioned I want to do a story about Black Wall Street. And somebody here, a few people who worked here said, oh, here are the books that you should read. First one was uh, Death in a Promised Land by Scott Ellsworth, who's in this film. Um, and if it wasn't for this place, I wouldn't have made this film. Wow. Um, so 
here we are two years later and we're watching it here full circle. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed the film. Thank you. Let's get a film on the hanger. You okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, there are two things I want to raise. I'm going to raise one first. Like, you did not go chronological is the mm. term. You went back and forth. And you went way back before the destruction of Black Wall Street to lay the basis for, well, where did this come from anyway? Because it wasn't just segregation. Because every city where there were black people, there was the same segregation and there were businesses that sprang up because you couldn't, you, you know, shop at the white businesses and all like that. But they weren't like Greenwood. Mm. They were not Black Wall Street because there was a more self-contained thing there. But anyway, you were going back and forth yeah. and I didn't expect it. Mm. But I think it's important because the past ain't the past if you're still living it. Mm. And we are still living it and grappling with it. So what? So I'm so happy you said that, because that was one of the hardest things about making this film, is going back and forth between the contemporary and the past, right? And how they bleed together, right? One of the, um, one significant thing that I was told repeatedly is that the massacre happened, but then there was a hundred years after that, right? The massacre happened, but uh, we were destroyed again, right? And so I couldn't take the contemporary away from uh, the history, uh, the historical. And then this, at the same time, this was 2020, 2019. So this was around the time of Trump. This is around the time of you know, America facing its past and unbearing its, you know, digging up its past. And here, as this, this microcosm of exactly what we were dealing with in America, literally digging wow. up the past, right? Um, and so I don't think that I could have just done the story that way. It had to, it's a bit, sometimes it's confusing even watching it, but I just felt like it had to, to work that way. Okay, well, I, I thought it was very important because then you had a massacre, hundreds of people killed, a whole big neighborhood destroyed, like dozens of square blocks. They gave you numbers on some of the things. And they suppressed that. Now you got people saying, okay, it seems like it's off, but I, can <laughs> you is, hear me? It's off. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So anyway, do you think I should take this off? Take it off. Uh, Alright, okay. But then you had people suppressing that reality, and today you got people saying, you can't teach what they call critical race theory, by which they mean you can't teach the real history of this country. <clears throat> and by that they mean we got some more bad shit that we're going to do, horrible shit that we're going to do, and we're going to push it down on you, we're not going to let you expose it, we're not going to let you let it see the light of day. So we're actually fighting some similar things, but it's happening in the context of a powerful section of the people who run this country got a program that they're bringing down. And that program is, okay, the way to keep this capitalist imperialist bullshit together and going down is we got to take off that, what's it, the velvet glove and just bring the iron fist down. And that's what we're up against, you know, because, look, and not just in relation to black people. We, we're in relation to it, when you look at the situation of women. Women didn't have the vote, couldn't own property, and there's been a lot of struggle to bring you to a whole different point. And now the right to choose to have an abortion is being taken away. And that's part of that same fascist Trump Republican program. But then also, what do you have going against that? You have the Democrats who are trying to reach across the aisle and getting their hands slapped off and, and stabbed and all that kind of <laughs> shit with no answer to it. And it comes down to, 
they're actually also trying to keep the capitalist imperialist system and what it stands for together. But they got a different program. They're like, look, man, we've done this before. Let's do some slickster here. Let's invite a few oppressed people in and let them be faces representing for the system that's doing this shit to people. Malcolm used to call it the wolves and the fox. You know, the Republicans were the wolves, the Democrats were the fox. But they both members of the canine family. I try to get more scientific with it. And they are both political representatives of the same capitalist imperialist system with just a different way to go about it. And they're fighting over that. And this is going to bring me up to this thing of Greenwood being Greenwood again mm. as the solution. Because what hits me is that that is a solution which, one, you ain't going to be able to pull that off. Mm. And two, it isn't even what you should go for. Oh. Because Greenwood, you did have Stratford with that big hotel and dozens of rental properties. But then you had, you know, black people who were domestic workers for well-off white people and well-off black people. I don't want to bring that back into I don't want to just have some black people up on top. I don't think that's what we should be aiming for, and I don't think we should limit ourselves to that. I want to get rid of a situation where there's anybody on top of the majority of people, where that's been broken up. And doing that requires a revolution. And I understand why people would dream of, can we bring back Black Wall Street? Because they don't think we can go any farther than that. If we could just go that far, that would be good enough. But I don't think we're limited to that. I think because it feels but like, right, it, um, the, even the idea, dreamland, right? The idea that um, you could have a piece of something, a paradise, a piece of paradise, right? I think that is the, the you know, the dream or the feeling, right? Um, which, you know, after having talked with you, you know, um, how does that, why do you reconcile that? You're talking about J.B. Stratford, who's right up here, feels like, wow, that's it. That, that's what we're looking for. What else is there, right? Like, how, what else is there to dream, you know, other than that, having that slice of, of paradise? Well, what else there is to dream is getting out of a system where what you're aiming for is, can I get up top? and doing that by <laughs> stepping on people on the way up. You can't pull that off in a white supremacist system. You might be able to get a few black people up in there, but they're not gonna, they're not gonna let you have another wall, black Wall Street. That's not in the cards. That's not what either section of the ruling class is looking for. But you don't have to limit yourself to that because revolution is really something to go for. And by revolution, I mean overthrowing the capitalist imperialist system that has brought horror after horror on many, many groupings of oppressed people all the way down. Because that's the other thing about that non-chronological approach. We are still, you know, Black Wall Street and its destruction concentrated something, but then there was Buffalo, there was Charleston, there was El Paso, there was the Garlic Festival in, in California. You know, these people like in the name of the great replacement theory carrying out these massacres as kind of the unofficial wing of the official Trump wing. You know, because these, these great replacement theory people, they're, the, they're like the people that got deputized, the white yes. people that got deputized to go destroy Black Wall Street. And I don't have time to really get into this, but revolution is possible. And, it, and I want to bring you to your attention something that you should check out. It's a talk by Bob Avakian, the revolutionary leader that I follow. Something terrible or something truly emancipating. Profound crisis, deepening divisions, the looming possibility of civil war and the revolution that is urgently needed. We have copies of it here, and in here he gets into why this is a time when revolution becomes more possible exactly because of the infighting that's going on at the top 
and the vulnerability that that presents to the, for the system. And I really encourage people to check this out. I actually sent you the link to it, I'll give you the hard copy. I think, or, or somebody was supposed to send you the link, but I thought, I thought she did it. Yes, yeah, she did it. <laughs> check it out. But what I want to do now is I want to bring the audience in. Because you all have stayed here, you've watched the movie, you've heard us converse a little bit. I want to hear what y'all got to say. Oh, there's a mic. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There you go. Here. Well, there's a beautiful film, and I just want to know if there's a place that we can share this, if you uploaded it somewhere so that we can share this film with other people. Great question. I cannot do that because I, I don't own this film. It's owned by CNN and HBO, so it's on HBO. Oh, wow. HBO. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hi, thank you so much. That was a beautiful film, and I think taught me a lot that I didn't know about this already. Um, one question I had is, as I was watching this and seeing uh, Black Wall Street getting burned down and then rebuilding and then destruction again and rebuilding, it kind of was a parallel to me of all these national tragedies happening over and over and over again and how you kind of develop hope and you think things are going to get better and then they don't particularly I'm thinking of like Uvalde and Buffalo right now I guess how have you as you were making this film how did you think about that and did you kind of land on the side of hope or on the side of hopelessness or kind of how did you and I guess it's almost like for myself I'm trying to negotiate that Here's right now a great question um uh, uh I will tell you uh when I go to Tulsa when I would go to Tulsa um Go down to Greenwood, and it is tiny, it is sad, it is on purpose, right? Um, and down the street, and instead of, one, um, them taking that strip of Greenwood and saying, we are going to uh, um, actually put resources into this community, they're building a BMX place down, down the way, like a big skate park, right? Not for black people, not for the community, but maybe it'll bring some money in, right? So when I see that, I think, wow, these people who live here, they hope, they have this hope for what it could be. They have these uh, dreams of what dream, uh, Greenwood could be, um, but they're, they're building a BMX park down the way and everything else is dilapidated. So for me, on the outside, I come in and I feel like, mm, you know, a, very hopeless. Uh, people in the community, they're still fighting, they're there, and they feel less hopeless than I do. So that would be honest for me. Um, first of all, fair play. It was congratulations. It was a really good film. Um, I just have a question of a very practical nature. Um, I didn't catch the name of the guy, um, the son of the man who was on the commission. The the guy Kevin was the Ross video. Ross and Don Ross. Yes. What's what's the son's name? Kevin. Kevin. Yes. So like not Kevin. Not Kevin. 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 Yes. Okay, with K. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. That was literally my only <laughs> question. But thank you so much. It was really good. <laughs> What, I, wait, I'm curious, what were you interested in about Kevin? Oh, it's just, it's just for my personal, I only remember things when I write them down, so <laughs> it's just for my personal, just like have a good one. Yeah, I, I know that feeling. <laughs> so, it's still open. Now, let me just say this on this question of hope. Oh, look, people have hoped and striven for things. And, and just you take my lifetime, which actually is fairly long now that I think about it, <laughs> since we go back to the <laughs> 1960s as an adult, because I was growing up when I refused to go to Vietnam. You fight, and sometimes you make advances, and things were, a lot of advances happened in the 60s. I mean, revolution got put on the map, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords Party, you know, SDS, there were forces, there were people who wanted to get rid of this system and they really tried and we didn't succeed. And you can say, I guess that means it can't happen, or you can dig into, okay, what did we accomplish? Why didn't we break through? And how do we go forward and go farther and do better in the future? And 
I'm raising this to make two points. One is, that is why I follow Bob Avakian, because he has actually led that kind of process. You know, not ne neither giving up hope and saying, that's it, I'm going to give it up, or just continuing to trod forward the way you were before without actually digging into what were the obstacles and how do you overcome those obstacles, that kind of revolutionary scientific approach. And I really encourage anybody who has a heart for humanity, who sees these horrors and wants to break through on them, to dig into Avakian's work on this. And that talk that I held up was one to do that. And then the other thing I want to say is, revolution is not a spectator sport. It requires involvement. And if you're feeling that way, you need to get involved in this revolution. And there are some very entry, entry ways for that. One is, this bookstore is doing a used book sale Saturday and Sunday from noon to 7. And we're doing that to raise funds for the bookstore, because we've got to keep this place open and operating, but also for the National Get Organized for an Actual Revolution tour, which is spreading the message of the possibility and the need for revolution around the country right now. They're in Los Angeles and promoting the fact that we have leadership that can lead in making this, this happen. You want to get involved, the way to do it is to be a part of making this used book sale as successful as possible. And there are people in the back, one of them's raising their hand now, I don't know if there are any others, who you can talk to about that because we need people to help set up for that, we need people to actually be in the store and helping customers, you know, work their way through the books. And then there's also someone from the Revolution Club of New York City <laughs> who are people who are doing the same thing as the National Get Organized for an Actual Revolution Tour. They're just not moving around the country doing it. They're doing it here in New York City. One of them's right here up front. Talk with them. Get into it with them. But, uh, I didn't say this to end the conversation. I want to bring out more. So who else? Did I see any hands up there in the back? Actually, I was thinking about the two of you who just turned around to look behind you. Because I thought you were looking like you wanted to say something. But if you weren't, that's cool. I love the film. <laughs> the, the, I, I did not have something to say. Well, you could tell us why you loved it. Um, Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it is, I, I mean, as, as the film said, and as we've been saying, just like an incredibly important piece of history that has been actively covered up. And I feel like we need to be doing a lot of work to make sure that this is something that everybody knows about and that it's not um, hidden away, I guess. Um, because because it's, it's also not at all an isolated event. And it's, it, it's like, so pervasive and events like this have happened so many yeah. times throughout history not just in this country just all across the world and it's something that I feel like on the whole a lot of people just actively try not to think yeah. about great point and what you said and coupled with something somebody else said um, the thing that keeps happening over and over this is not the first film of, about Black Wall Street this is not the first film about Black Street uh, Black Wall Street that year Right? There's like six other films that came out about this, which I'm so happy about because, do you know, we tell white stories, the same one over and over and over. <laughs> we can tell the story over and over and over. You know, um, uh, ten years ago, fifteen years ago, there were a couple books written. You know, people come into the community, they write the books, and they leave the community, and people in the community are like, well, "What happened? What, what's going on?" You know, um, even with this, what happens after the knowing? Right? What happens after the people know? Then what happens? Because guess what? Um, you know, this film came out, uh, and it, sh it showed once or twice on television, right? And then it got buried for a year until February, Black History Month, right? <laughs> so, who are the gatekeepers? Who you know? There are a lot of people who weren't able to watch this film, right? Um, and so the people who I went to in Tulsa and said, you know, we're going to get your story out, 
their story didn't get out the way that they wanted it to, right? So again, what happens after the knowing? Is it just for us to know and say, okay, great, I know this. This is great. Uh, and then move on, right? And those people are still sort of dealing with the shit that they're dealing with, and we get to feel happy that we know now. So, you know, I struggle with this. I struggle with this a lot, what happens after the knowing, right? Okay, I'll go there and then I'll go in the back. Uh, sorry, I have another question of a practical nature. <laughs> kind of going off what, you're, what you were just saying, what you were both just saying there. Um, is there any updates on that? Because it sounded in the documentary like there were multiple uh, places where the bodies yes. have been buried. Yes. So has have the <coughs> investigations continued? Um, um, great question. Yeah, any um, updates on that? Yes, they have. Because of the pandemic, it went very slow. It went much slower than they were supposed to, to go. Um, but it's still, I, I get updates from people in the community all the time. You know, they pushed it to this time. You know, we're, we're going to be ex excavating at the other place. Um, so it's still, it's still going on. But again, the world has sort of forgotten about utils. It's 100 years after the massacre sounds better than 101 years after the, the massacre, right? So that's, it's still going on. It's still happening. Okay, all the way in the back, one of the staff people. Hi. Um, yes, it's on. Thanks, Salima, for doing that and um, for bringing it here. And I know when Salima first came back and said, you know, I got the books here, you guys. <laughs> and she said, I'm so pissed that the movie isn't getting out. You know, it's, and, and that question, I, I don't know if this is even a question exactly, but... Um, the question about what happens when you know, I think is a really important question. And it's hard. I, I mean, the, I watched the movie last week when we were getting ready to screen it, and I still think about it every day. It's hard to watch this. And it's hard to know that children got killed in Philadelphia in 1985 mm -hmm. in the Move Massacre, and a whole generation doesn't even know that. And that was just in our lifetimes, most some of us here, anyway. <laughs> um, but I just think that that when you know the the people who had in that you show in the movie who are alive and those who went before who had aspirations of something that has been crushed over and over and over, I really feel that the way we have to honor those people and people that this happens to all over the world because of what this fucking country does. You know, is to actually bring the shit down. That's the way we have to honor them, and it's the only way. I mean, I just people are talking about it all day. Brenda, I, I I interviewed you guys saw I interviewed the mayor of Tulsa, G. T. Bynum, whose yeah. family, whose who I didn't even get into this, but his family is like knights of whatever to the temple, whatever they are, right? From yeah. the, you know the first. His, his, grand, his great grandfather, the second mayor, his other grandfather, the fifth mayor, right? He, um, when I spoke, spoke with him, yeah, he wants to do the, the um, uh, excavation. That's as far as he'll go. He won't go, he won't, doesn't want to talk about reparations. He doesn't want to talk about uh, the, the other part, the money part, the how do we actually reconcile. But, the, you know, but they'll have a bunch of memorials, you know, here's a plaque, here's a thing, a commemoration. <laughs> Um, and these are the people, and I think I feel so, um, uh, hopeless is not the word, angry, maybe, because these are the gatekeepers, you know, G.T. Bynum can say, I found some bodies, you know, um, and won't have to go further than that until the next mayor comes in and has to deal and with it. And he's the good guy. And he's the good guy, right? Like, he's the good guy. Um, so it is, it's, it's frustrating, it's disheartening, um, but you're right. But that was part of my point. I think the hope is that this could actually happen. Mm. That we, what Carl is talking about, the revolution and bringing it to some, being something totally different. There's no other way black people are going to get justice in this country. Mm. <laughs> Not since 1619. It's built in. Everything that happened in Tulsa and happens up till now is built in. But, but anyway, I, I won't repeat it. I won't go on. Nope. Oh, you're the only hand up. Well, I don't know that. I'm in the first one. <laughs> I'm looking at the whole thing. Okay, you're the only I can see your eyes. Um, I want to uh, have two questions. 
one of them is sort of related to the whole thread of hope or hopelessness, but a little different. One of the other shows that was made, I don't remember the name of it, um, one of the residents from Tulsa was interviewed and spoke about the fact that people, you know, generation after generation since the massacre would not talk about yes. this in their families. Now, one of the people, I, I know it's not everybody, yeah. so it's a different story than you told here, um, but it, it, it just shocked me when I heard that. Mm -hmm. And then Brenda mentioned the MOVE massacre in 1985, and I thought, God, I remember back then, there was some vague mention at that time that mm -hmm. that wasn't the first time black people were bombed. But nobody really knew what that story was. This story was hidden mm. from the world until either the 80s or the 90s. I forget the exact year. Yeah. Um, so I'm bringing that up because it was in this other uh, movie about Tulsa. Mm. And, you know, it just brings up another issue about when, are, when and how are people, all oppressed people, but in this case black people, going to get free when, when they themselves you know, are participants in hiding that history. Yeah. That is, it is a very powerful thing yeah. when people can face and confront th as things actually are. So I, I did want to just, you know, if you had any comments on that. And my second, let me just, I'll just say this, yeah. so I don't forget it. Um, I'm just interested in what work you're doing now. <laughs> no, seriously, I was just so powerfully moved by how some of the comments you all made before mm. about back going back and forth on the chronology. You just did things very, very creatively. Thank you. And so that's my second question. Well, um, I'll answer your second question. This film was, uh, this topic was on my heart for a long time right. when I first read about it. Right. Um, and then also when I was told it, it wasn't a story that people wanted to hear, right? It was still on my heart. Not to say that, um, you know, I do, I, I like to tell stories about um, people, about um, the human experience, mm -hmm. um, and this movie is not just about the Tulsa massacre, it's about a dream deferred. Mm -hmm. It's a, something that we can all sort of um, relate to, that universal feeling. Mm -hmm. um, so any story I tell, whether it's about black people, whether it's about gamers, whether it's about what is, has that universal feeling of feeling small and wanting to, you know, knowing that you're big in your, in your spirit, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's one. Um, and your first question was? It was about the hidden history, the history. and how people, yeah. the generations participated in not facing it and bringing it so, in the you know. A lot of people, it, you, you, we think we don't know about the massacre. People who grew up in, in Oklahoma, right. in Tulsa, right. didn't know about the massacre, right? right. right. People who, um, who uh, they found out uh, randomly from their parent maybe mentioning something, right? right? right. And they get, they get into it. Uh, this is a bit above my, my knowing, so I'm just gonna, you know, um, this is the trauma, what does trauma do to you? Right to speak of the evil that happened. Said, the person said it, let those worms die, right? Let's yeah, not even that's right. talk I about it, about right? Yeah. Right, and why Why revisit, it's re-traumatizing. And what's gonna happen, what do you do when you re-speak um, about it? One, it's almost like this evil that you're speaking that you can bring back to yourself. And two, the power, um, the helplessness, uh, if you do talk about it. I, 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 could, I don't understand it exactly, but I could feel, I can feel it, right? Um, and then it's almost for some people is like a fever dream. Mm -hmm. You know, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people now, very young, I think there's three survivors left. One's, 110, one's 106, 105, 102. Um, and they were really young when it happened. Right. Um, but I, I think that's a great question, this mm -hmm. idea of trauma and what does tra how does trauma work itself through history? Um, and how does it sort of insidiously spread itself through uh, the family, right? Um, I think that's another question. I think that's, you know, I think that's, a, you, you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. That was a very powerful film, very heartbreaking, um, but I learned a lot from it. And I actually wanted to ask what your creative direction was for 
adding in the Native American history tied to Tulsa because that was really eye-opening to me and something that I didn't know before. I'm so happy you brought that up. Um, because Oklahoma itself, is, I learned so much about Oklahoma. Oklahoma had the most black towns. Um, they wanted Oklahoma to be a black state, right? That was supposed to be a black state. Um, and Oklahoma is so interesting because a lot of, you have a lot of different intersections. You had the Native American intersection, you had the white intersection, you had the black intersection, you had the freedmen, the freed slaves intersection, all that. So Oklahoma is a very special place, right, if you look at its history. I thought it was so interesting to find out about why they were called the five civilized tribes, mm -hmm. right? I never even thought about the word civilized. I never even thought about it um, until seeing that. And one of the reasons is because they owned slaves. Wow, how interesting, right? I thought it was very important to show, ask the question, how did, how did Black Wall Street come to exist? How did, how did Greenwood come to exist, okay? It came to exist because they started off as slaves who got a lot of, who got a lot of land, land after, right? right? right. After freeing their slaves, um, something that the whites didn't even want to do, right? After being forced to free their slaves. Now these people get allotments, so that's, so, and then on top of that, they find out that this land has what oil, right? So I think just to sort of set, set the stage for what Oklahoma was, um, and also sort of subvert what you think about history, right? Um, it was interesting for, for me too. And in the same way that we have to, again, I talked about facing your past and facing your history, even if it's extremely uncomfortable, I think for, there's a woman in there, her name is Wil Wilma Mankiller, you, you saw yeah, her, yeah. right? She has to face her history um, of Cherokee slave owning, right? Uh, I, for me, that was just a co complication, necessary complication. But true. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hi. It's on. It's yeah, on. Okay. Well, hi. Great movie. Um, uh, yeah, what was my question? Yes, um, you talked about, and this relates more to the previous question, you talked about how um, this trauma shapes, obviously, how you're living uh, in America currently. And this made me think of um, the analogy I've heard a lot of times that living in America as someone of color is sort of like a horror movie. And um, I wanted to ask if uh, for you, uh, uncovering this made you feel like, um, well, what, do, what else do we not know? Um, what, what is there that maybe has been covered up so well that um, we, will, we might never know about it? What other atrocities? had happened, and yeah, I, w I wanted to ask you how, how that makes you feel. Uh, great, I think, um, uh, one, I want to ask you, just out of curiosity, where are you from? Uh, Germany. Germany, mm. okay. Um, I, uh, sorry, um, as, as I, you'll find out, uh, in, in, with or without researching for this film, um, that there are a lot of other black communities that were burned to the ground by white communities. You know, you could name a lot of them, right? That happened around the same time. Um, the Red Summer. Right, the Red Summer, around 1919 to 1922 or something like that. It was the Reds, you know, right? Um, that's when all that was happening. So, we, uh, I think a lot of us already knew this, but it's, it's not until you dive deep into the horrors of that you really realize and understand what the horrors are. I mean, there are horrors that I couldn't even fit into the film, right? The horrors that are still happening today. The fact that a lot of these uh, black business owners are being deliberately pushed out, right, of their homes. It's another horror having to think, you, you know, your, your rents are being raised specifically to kick you out. That's a horror thinking about. You know, uh, I had someone say that they can't sleep. They stay awake every night thinking about paying the rent to stay in Greenwood, right? Um, so no, I don't, th I don't think, oh, what else horrors are there? I know that there are horrors out there. I know that I just don't know. Uh, I just haven't, un I haven't uncovered them. We haven't uh, learned about them, but they're there. Thank you. Oh, you're actually had your hand up before you did here. <laughs> Tattoo, tattoo. Uh, thank you for the film. I mean, it's so, it's so moving, very powerful, I have to say. So I had an invitation and I had a 
a, a, um, a question. Sure. So, and the invitation is uh, for people to want to learn more about this movement. You know, uh, two things. One is our website, right? Come that us, and there is a there is a there's a series called American Crimes. Mm. So people should uh, take note of this. This is from Bobby Baker. Three things that have to happen in order for there to be a real lasting change for the better. Number one is people have to fully confront the actual history of this country and its role in the world up to today and the terrible consequences of this. Number two, people have to dig seriously and scientifically into how this system of capitalist imperialism actually works and how this actually causes in the world. And finally, number three is people have to look deeply into the solution to all of this, right? And the other thing, the other sort that people could do is RNA show. It's a, it's a show that where people can actually learn about this movement, learn about the leadership of Bobby Bacon, you know, the kind of leader he is, you know, the work he's been done, and also the movement for revolution, because it actually, you know, organizing right now to put an end to this chorus like Tosa, you know, also, uh, I like to appreciate this because the, one of the books that I really, you know, gave me to know about Tulsa was, uh, you know, Dead on the Promised Land. Oh, wow. So when yeah. you say that, we're like, oh, wow. And I get to see the, you know, wow. the author there, really, yeah. you know, really, I was like, man, I really want to see great. it. <laughs> right? What's it? This is like two years, two years ago before the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. So I went, like, I went, like, I saw, like, people don't know about this. <laughs> like, I had to tell everybody I know. Yeah. That this, you know, because people just, you know, that, that's what I find is so important. Mm. So uh, my question is like, because uh, the final part of the film when it talks about the mattress, that was like, the, you know, that really hit me Which very one? hard. Which one? When they talk about what? When they find the 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 mash grapes, oh, finally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, just it was so oh. so like, in, you know, very moving. But also, like, I want you to, I would like to hear from you. Like, what was your reaction? When you find out about that, they actually find remains oh. of the the micro because you were like, hey, they're really there. What, great, what happened great. to these people? You Good know? question. Okay, so when I, I remember where I was when I found out about this, so I had two, I had two reactions. One, oh my God, they found the bodies. You know, every all the, all the reporters because there's all the reporters all across the nation came. Right, I happened to not be there at the scene when they found the, the bodies because I felt like I, I wanted to be somewhere else. I wanted to be with some people. So I was interviewing with some, you know, filming with some people. Uh, there's one woman in there. Um, she has short gray hair. Her name is, um, uh, uh, her name is, she's uh, Representative Goodwin. Oh, right. um, you remember her, she talks about urban renewal, urban renewal, she's a, mm -hmm. she's a great character. Um, and, uh, sorry, I was trying to thought. Who was your question again? Oh, uh, do we actually know the Oh, right, right, okay, so I was, I was there with her and um, we were very excited when it happened and then she said, you guys might seem excited, but we had we we said the bodies were there. Mm -hmm. Here, it's in this report. I'm not surprised because we said this 20 years ago, right? So you had one faction who felt like this is great. Oh my God! And then you had another faction who was like, Yeah, we said this 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So now we're even more upset that the bodies are there, right? Um, so it was almost like this, you know, two mm -hmm. sort of feelings. Like the ancestors have gotten to, you know, there were 12 bodies, right? And there were 300 people who were killed. Uh, um, estimate it. Mm. So where are those other bodies? Right yeah. in the river, in this. So mm. it's bittersweet. Yes, they found these bodies, um, but where are the rest of them? Yeah. Right. It's almost like you know, for some politicians, yeah, we found the bodies. We can go home. Mm. You know, but that's not actually the truth. All right. <laughs> so I'm of two two feelings about about this. Um, it's a bit complicated. Mm. Yeah. I'm sorry for, I'm, I'm, I'm like making everybody feel sad. <laughs> I don't know what that's what I'm doing, but I just wanna, want you guys to know what I, what I learned when I was, do, you know, doing this, right? So, um, I believe Carl is your name, yes, right? Yes, Carl. Yeah, um, so you said earlier that um, they would never let anything like Black Wall Street happen ever again. And I was just wondering if you could dig into that a little bit deeper. I mean, okay, we well, all know yeah. that it relates to the gentrification issue that was also shown in the movie. But, uh, I mean, you let me get into it. In if you watching this movie, you get a sense well where Black Wall Street came from. And the segregation 
was actually a big part of what created the basis for there to be black businesses mm -hmm. because there was a market that was not being tapped into yes. by the white owned businesses. And so that created the opportunity for black business owners to, to create businesses to meet the needs of that market. And because it was in Oklahoma where there had been this land that large numbers of black people got mineral rights from that land, there was wealth that enabled it to build up a fairly, I can't remember, think of the term, but they could actually put together much more of the economy than happened. In, because everywhere where black people lived, you had segregation that helped to create black businesses, but almost, I can't think of anywhere where it was on the level of Greenwood because of those circumstances. And the oil, the okay. oil. Yeah, the, the oil, oil being part of it, because the, the land and the mineral rights, yeah. that created the basis for a much more robust black capitalist sector. What you have coming off of that is one of the outcomes of the desegregation movement, which wasn't the aim of the desegregation movement, is that it undercut a lot of the basis for these black businesses. Mm -hmm. And they largely disappeared. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you have businesses that are very successful that black people own today, they're not so based on we only serve the black community. You have to branch out and you also have to establish a relationship with the overall community because if you fail to do the overall economy mm -hmm. dominated by capitalists imperialists who are largely white you don't do that you get crushed i mean i have this t-shirt that i like it's called cross colors from before many of you all were born these black guys in la put together this clothing company and they would put out t-shirts that would say things like love knows no colors. When the rebellion broke out in LA following the beating of Rodney King and the exoneration of the pigs who did it, they put out all kinds of t-shirts with a lot of different colors, but also slogans pointing to that and pointing to police brutality. And they blew up, you know, they <laughs> became a huge phenomenon but they did not link themselves in with the overall economy. They were gonna do their own thing on their own and they got crushed. And part of how they got crushed was to keep going. They sold some of their stuff to uh, major clothing companies who then put it on sale at prices that they could not sink down to. So they were doing their new stuff, but then their old stuff was being sold for much less than they could sell their new stuff for. So they couldn't sell their new stuff and they just got crushed. So you're dealing with a system that really calls the shots. You know, like Raymond Lotta, who is also based here in uh, Revolution Books New York, could really break this down for you because political economy is his field. But that's what, that's what you're dealing with. And you're not going to have that opening to build up a distinct black economic center the way that you had in the past with the segregation. And you also are not going to get the thing of large numbers of large amount of land mm -hmm. with mineral rights. You're not going to get that either. <laughs> because one thing. I mean, like they are they are studying reparations now. Yeah, yeah. In California, <laughs> yes. and Congress has been passed trying to pass this bill for a few decades now about reparations, but it ain't happening. You know, and, and and look, reparations is a very just demand when you look at the horrors and, and not only for black people but especially for black people. But you got to talk about the indigenous people. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about reparations because the wealth of this country and basically two sources 
stealing the land from the native inhabitants, enslaving black people. Two very savage endeavors, too, which is another part of why they don't want you to teach the real history. <laughs> they don't want to say, oh, this country, you know, it's based on <laughs> theft, slavery, and <laughs> savagery. <laughs> You know, they want to say, well, America is based on ingenuity and hard work. No, it is based on theft. It is based on slavery, and it's based on savagery. That's where America came from. That, you know, America, that's what America's great at, stealing, <laughs> enslaving people, and inflicting savage horrors on people. They're great at that. They're number one at that. You know, and another reason why we got to get rid of them, because we don't need, that's got to be stopped. That's, but, but anyway, so that's my thing on that. And, you know, hold me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps there's a, somewhere where I got off the scientific track in trying to undermine that. We can talk about it. But what we really need to look at is how do we end these horrors? And it is possible to do that. And I want to, because I was thinking about this thing about hope and trauma. Mm -hmm. And I thought about Langston Hughes, mm -hmm. his poem, A Dream Deferred. Yeah. What happens to a dream deferred? And I used to only understand it by the last line mm -hmm. where he talks about, does it explode? Because yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah, it should explode. <laughs> but he actually says there are a lot of things that could happen in relation to that, yeah. and he's actually right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, just because there's a dream deferred doesn't mean it's going to explode. Other things are needed. You actually need people to have hope. You need people to actually understand the reality, but you also need them to have hope that the reality can be transformed. Yeah. And all of that needs to be brought together. And that's an important part of the work that Bob Avakian has led this movement for an actual revolution to carry out, both in terms of his assessment of the current day situation and the rare time when revolution becomes more possible, bringing forward an understanding and strategy for how that could be carried out. He's even authored a constitution for a future socialist republic in North America. In other words, laying out what kind of society a revolution could bring into being starting with day one after the revolution and working forward from that. And that constitution is actually up there on the shelf. Yeah, somebody's pointing it out. You could check that out. All of that needs to be brought together and then the one last thing I'll do is because whenever I think about like the, the no, what do you do after you know? Mm -hmm. Well, part of it is do you really confront what you just learned? And, and there's another cultural thing, and I always think of this in relation to the Isley Brothers, but it's not really their song. I just heard it first from them. It's really Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young song. And it's Ohio. I don't know if everybody knows that, but there's a refrain, and it's like, What if you knew that girl lying dead on the ground? How could you run when you know? And in other words, it's like you have to learn this stuff, but then you have to confront what it means that this stuff really happened, what the reality actually is. And do you confront it or do you run away? And that's an important thing. And, and the question of hope comes back in, including the hope that things could be different. And I want to bring this around to the Revolution Nothing Less show that uh, Tatu talked about. It's a YouTube show that the Revcoms produce every week. Premieres Thursday at 8 p.m. East Coast time. But in the most recent episode of that show, Noche Diaz, who uh, is on the National Revolution Tour, reads a statement about the death of a young man, a 16-year-old in Chicago, who had put together his goals and said, I'm going to do all this if I live to be 21. And Noche reads a statement 
essentially speaking to all of those youth who aren't sure they're going to live that long. And he, you really got to, you got to hear the statement. You got to go on YouTube, the uh, Revolution Nothing Less show channel. That's their channel. The right? Revcons. The Revcon channel. That's the channel. And check out that statement from No Check because he really breaks it down and ends it with an invitation and a challenge for people to act to change the reality that has so many of our youth facing a situation where they can't even dream about living past 21, you know, because they don't think they're going to make it that far. And what do you do about a system that has our youth in that kind of situation, looking at things that way? That's like another major indictment and another reason to get rid of it through revolution. Which I didn't mean to go on and on on that, but I, I did it, so. <laughs> uh, someone's telling me something? Quarter to 10. Oh, there's a clock right there. I can tell it. <laughs> I just want to see if people want to keep it. Look, the floor is still open. Somebody want to jump into it? They can. If not, like, thank people for coming out. Don't make this your last time here. In fact, mark your calendar for Saturday and Sunday to use book sale. There will be... You find books that you wouldn't, didn't expect to find. I found many treasures at that, but I have to restrain myself from buying them until the sale is over because I don't want to block other people getting the treasures. But also, you can participate in it. Talk with people here at Revolution Books about that. We can uh, talk informally. But I guess I'm going to close the formal part of the program right now. Maybe she has some oh. yes, words. Hold it, hold it. They're pointing out. Uh, uh, you up here with a mic too. <laughs> oh, um, I don't have anything else to say. I would just say thank you so much for coming. This is a film we made a year ago and it's still relevant um, as you know, you guys are showing me. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you.